Good morning and welcome to the Cathedral Church in Halifax, Nova Scotia. As we welcome you, this is the Sunday that we have sprung forward, so if you need to adjust your clocks mentally or literally, we understand. Most researchers on sleep patterns agree that it can take up to a week to get ourselves back on track, so that makes the option of tuning in online fairly attractive. March break is now underway, so again, wherever you travel, you can take us with you and find us for worship. We have a nursery available, not staffed at this service, but anyone who, makes, who needs to make use of that can do so out through the side door. The in-person experience, we remind you that we host services at 9.30 on Sunday morning. The 9.30 Eucharist gathers around the font this service at 11 a.m., and in the afternoon, our Sundays at 4 offering, choral evensong or a concert event. You can find the schedule for that series on the Cathedral Church of All Saints website, where you will also find today's bulletin, as well as a calendar of events for activities to come. During the week, we also hold a Eucharist service on Wednesday mornings at 7.30 a.m. in person, and at noon Wednesdays, a meditation group meets in the Cathedral Chapel. Fridays at noon, a Book of Common Prayer communion service. Online, Monday through Saturday, tune in for morning prayer and reflections posted at 6.30 a.m. and available for viewing any time thereafter. And on Thursday evenings, an online meditation group gathers via Zoom. To link up with that group, send an email to prayasyoucan3 at gmail.com. We've been telling you the past few weeks about the upcoming Vital Church Maritime Conference that will be held April 27th to the 29th in Truro. The conference is open to anyone, lay or clergy. It features relevant and inspiring presentations, discussion and sharing time, creative worship, prayer and more. Conference registration includes materials and most meals. Funding support is available through the diocese. The keynote speaker will be the Reverend Dr. Don Davis and a special guest, Stephen Doucette Campbell, a registered psychotherapist. He will lead two sessions on leadership, mental health, and resilience. Also, the Anglican Church Women's Diocesan Board and the Mother's Union Diocesan Council are co-hosting this Wednesday, March 15th, 7 to 8.15, a virtual Lenten reflection theological postulants from our diocese, offering reflections on our upcoming synod theme, We Shall All Be Changed. All are welcome. You can RSVP your intent by sending an email to acw.nsboard at gmail.com. Please mark your calendars for Sunday, March the 26th, the annual general meeting of the cathedral. The meeting will be held in person in the Great Hall following our 11 o'clock service. And lastly, this morning, we welcome the Reverend Stephen Booth to the cathedral. Born in England, his family emigrated to Massachusetts in 1960. He was ordained in the U.S. Episcopal Church and over the years has served in parishes in the U.S. and the Diocese of Toronto, as well as teaching in the Anglican Church of Uganda. He has also attained a PhD in environmental design and rural planning and is a facilitator for understanding resource issues with respect to Mi'kmaq fisheries. That's just a quick thumbnail sketch, so do take some time to introduce yourselves to him. Stephen and his wife Jillian now reside in Chester. And as we welcome him today, next Sunday he will be our celebrant at this service. As we gather today, we acknowledge the lands on which we come to meet. So we begin by acknowledging that we are in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the trees of peace and friendship, which Mi'kmaq and Wulastuig peoples first signed with the British crown in 1725. The treaties did not deal with surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq and Maliseet title and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. We will begin our worship with an introit by our choir.
turn now to today's bulletin and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our colic prayer for this, the third Sunday of the Lenten journey, page four of your bulletin. And let us pray together. Lord of the wellspring, source of life and truth, give us the courage of the Samaritan woman so that we may receive living water and worship you in spirit and in truth through Jesus Christ who quenches our thirst with eternal life. Amen. We invite you to be seated for the reading of Scripture. <clears throat> A reading from Exodus. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, what shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock of Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so. In the sight of the elders of Israel, he called the, pla the place Massa and Meribah 
because of the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? The word of the Lord. Continuing, we'll read Psalm 95 responsively. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with songs. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hands are the caverns of the earth and the heights of the hills are also his. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee and kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. Harden not your hearts as your forebears did in the wilderness, at Meribah and on that day at Massa, when they tempted me. They put me to the test, though they had seen my works. Forty years long I detested that generation and said, This people are wayward in their hearts. They do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Creator of all, we give you thanks for a world full of wonder, but above all, because you have called us into a holy fellowship with you and with each other. Guide us in the ways of this, your new creation, rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us the well and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. 
The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say, Four months more, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from the city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believe because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of, of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. The Gospel of Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be now and always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. 
That's one of the longest gospel stories that we read over a season. So fasten your seatbelt for a long sermon. <laughs> Not really, I'm as sleep deprived as you are. Just a bit of trivia though as we begin. You may not know that we use an ecumenical lectionary cycle for our scripture readings on Sunday. We don't just pick the readings at random, nor does the preacher get to choose his or her favorite passages to preach on, unfortunately. This lectionary was formally approved back in 1983 as a way of promoting unity among Christian denominations so that we would all be using the same readings across our respective churches on any given Sunday. And it is a three-year cycle, which means we get to read a wide scope of the Bible across that time span, and then we repeat the cycle again three years later. So the last time we read this gospel story was three years ago, the last Sunday, before the state of emergency was declared and we closed our church doors, not knowing how long that closure would be or what the future would hold for us. Last week, if you were here, you would have heard the story of an encounter between Jesus and a man named Nicodemus. Nicodemus is described by the gospel writer John as a Pharisee and a leader of the Jews. Now Nicodemus was somewhat conflicted because Jesus has come under scrutiny by his peers as someone who strayed outside the prescribed norms of religious tradition and culture, and he is attracting large crowds of followers. So Nicodemus comes to see Jesus under the cover of darkness because despite the criticism of his colleagues, he is convinced that no one could do the works Jesus is doing unless they were sent by God. There is a hole in his life that he seeks to fill to become whole, and perhaps Jesus holds that hope. Today we read another story of Jesus and a woman he meets on the outskirts of the city of Sychar in the middle of the day. The story on the surface is a simple narrative. Jesus and his disciples are out on the road, carrying their message of hope and salvation in the early days of his ministry, and that missionary journey has taken them into Galilee. In fact, if we go back to chapter 2 of John's Gospel, we would find Jesus performing his first miracle, that of turning water into wine at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And following that event, he heads back to Jerusalem for the Passover, where we read of him cleansing the temple of those who have turned that holy shrine into little more than a marketplace for tourists. And while he is there, the authorities, political and religious, discover that his followers are growing in number. And in the first four verses of chapter 4, which are admitted from our reading this morning, we learn that the Pharisees heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John. So Jesus and his disciples left Judea and started back to Galilee. But John, our gospel writer, notes he had to go through Samaria. If you were to look at a map, Galilee is here, Samaria here, and Judah and Jerusalem down here. Now we pause there for a moment. We know something of the tension between Jews and Samaritans. It is at the core of the message of the parable of the quote, Good Samaritan, where Jesus describes a man who has been robbed and beaten and left by the side of the road. That man is ignored by a passing priest and a Levite, respectable members of society, and it is a man from Samaria who stops to dress his wounds, carry him to safety, and to safeguard his future. To the listener of that story, describing him as a good Samaritan 
was an oxymoron, like jumbo shrimp or civil war. Good and Samaritan didn't sit easily side by side on the tongue. And the history of this enmity was long and like most prejudice was based on half-truths and misunderstandings which dated back almost a thousand years. Following the death of King Solomon in 932 BC, the kingdom of Israel was split into two political entities. Israel was the northern region with Samaria as its capital and Judah in the south with Jerusalem as its capital. Each ended up with their own temple, the Samaritans on Mount Gerizim, the Jews on Mount Sion in Jerusalem. This is probably more than you need to know, but it's helpful to have the context. Don't bother to take notes. There will be no test. But over the ensuing centuries, in its various conflicts and battles with neighboring countries and foreign powers, Samaria was conquered by the Assyrians and the land became settled with foreigners. And these foreigners brought their pagan religious beliefs, which became entwined with that of the Hebrews, and the people began to intermarry. So the traditional Jews accused the Samaritans of idolatry, of abandoning their faith and their heritage, straying away from God, and they considered them now an inferior race. The hostility against Samaritans continued well into the first century of Jesus' time, so much so that devout Jews would actually go miles out of their way to avoid traveling through that hated land. They wouldn't set foot on Samaritan soil. So to read in today's gospel that Jesus, quote, had to go through Samaria on his return north to Galilee is a misnomer. He didn't have to go there. He chose to go there. So that's the backdrop to what takes place this morning in what will turn out to be the longest conversation recorded in Scripture that Jesus has with anyone and one of the most touching and revealing. So with that historical context, we return to our story. It is, we note, noon, the heat of the day. Jesus and company have stopped by an ancient well, said to have been dug by none other than Jacob himself. But there is no bucket or a rope or a ladle to draw up water. So close, yet out of reach. So Jesus sits down to rest and sends the disciples off into the city of Sychar to find food. Enter now the woman. We've set the stage for the relationship between the Jews and the Samaritans. As so often happens, we typically see these relationships from one side. The Jews have a problem with Samaritans, we get that. Well, the Samaritans have a problem with the Jews. Centuries of being despised and belittled breeds a mutual bitterness. So the woman arrives at the well, water jug in hand, and Jesus says to her, give me a drink. Now John doesn't say, please may I have a drink, just give me a drink. Maybe he left that out, but either way, the introduction is based on a request by Jesus. Give me a drink. And the Samaritan woman says to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? And how do you suppose she said those words? Was there an angry edge? How dare you ask me? Or who do you think you are asking me? Or was there wonderment that a Jew would speak to her was unusual that a man would speak to a woman conversationally in public was also unprecedented and questionable. And to think that he would take water from her was a religious transgression. Jesus would be unclean by doing so. Better to die of thirst than accept water from the likes of her would be the thinking. Now just another thought about this woman. 
John in writing says, it's the middle of the day and this woman is alone. It's an odd time of day to be drawing water in a place as hot as the Middle East. Most women or children who were tasked with getting water did so very early in the morning or in the cool of the evening, not at the hottest part of the day. Was she, in a word that has become part of our current vocabulary, social distancing, self-isolating? Why was she alone? Back at the start of the pandemic lockdown measures, our local Sobe store introduced what they called senior shopping hours. And between 7 a.m. and 8 a.m., seniors could shop before the general public was let in. And gladly, I realized I qualified. So I began a new routine of shopping at 7 a.m. every Monday morning. And most Mondays at that hour, I was one of the only persons, aside from those stocking shelves and the lone cashier in the store. I didn't need to interact with anyone. I felt safe and secure, masked and alone. But as time went on and weeks became months, there was an eeriness to that experience. And being alone became very lonely. Sometimes the wilderness we experience can be within as much as without, spiritual and emotional as well as physical. So I think back of that story of Nicodemus coming to Jesus in the dark of night and this woman seeking a time of day to carry out her tasks when she will be undisturbed, unnoticed. Why was she alone? And what loneliness did she experience? Was it because, as Jesus would reveal her history, she had been married five times and the man she is now with is not her husband? To be clear, I don't think this has anything to do with judgment or morality, but it has a lot to do with this woman's self, sense of self-image and perceived worth. This is not a case of being unlucky in love or making poor life choices about your partners. In a male-centered society, her plight was not of her own doing. A woman could not leave a husband. Perhaps her husband died, and as the law dictated, she was passed on to her husband's brother or brothers, who may also have died, or she may have been divorced from them and abandoned. Whatever the circumstance, she is not in that position of life by choice. It is what life has dealt to her. And no doubt she felt abandoned by God too. The cause effect theology of the day would see her as being rejected by God. So here she is on her own, avoiding the crowds of chattering women and their sideways glances, murmurings and innuendo. She approaches the well when no one else is out, only to encounter this stranger. And it must have been more than a bit unsettling for her. Jesus initiates the conversation that will follow with a simple request, give me a drink. Her wonderment or suspicion of this request is further deepened when in response to her questioning of that request, he says, if you knew who was asking you, you would have asked me and I would have given you living water. Living water. What does that even mean? A few weeks ago at the children's talk, I had a bottle of smart water. Not sure what that means either. But living water conjures up to me a swift running stream sparkling in the sun, as opposed to a dank pool in the bottom of a deep ancient well. We know that's not what he's talking about, but she doesn't. What do you mean, she asks. You don't have a bucket, and this well is deep. In other words, if you had access to water, why would you be asking me? 
Her literal interpretation of his remark causes her to say, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Now the conversation takes an even more curious turn, for Jesus says to her, go call your husband and come back. And the woman answers him, I have no husband. Whatever fear or apprehension she had in her initial encounter with this strange man has now faded. She tells him the truth of her life. And Jesus, in commending that truth and honesty, fills in the blanks. You are right. You've had five husbands, and the man you're with now is not your husband. Jesus' words were not meant to razzle, dazzle her, or impress her with wizard skills, nor to condemn her. But they go to the very heart of who she is and what she longs most deeply for. Jesus is saying, in essence, I know you. I know more about you than you know about yourself. And I see a worth and a value in you that has been lost and buried by life. That's the revelation. That's the water that does more than fill a jug or slate one's thirst. That's the water that gives and restores life. She, in a sense, is baptized in that moment, born anew. I know that when the Messiah comes, he will reveal everything, she stammers. I am he, the one that is speaking to you. Woe chills up and down her spine. To this woman, to this Samaritan woman, before Jesus admits to anyone else, before even confirming with his own disciples, Jesus reveals his true identity, that he is the Messiah. And the transformation that happens in that moment is amazing. This same woman who has borne the burden of her lot in life now rushes back to the city to tell anyone and everyone what has happened. But curious what she says. Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. In other words, come and see someone who knows me and accepts me for who I am. She is now liberated and overjoyed. Living water indeed flows in her. So what does that mean for us? We know that life can be challenging. We know that we all have history. We all know our longing to find a sense of acceptance, of love, of God's presence. Don't have time to dip into the first reading we heard this morning of those in the wilderness complaining to Moses because they need water. But what Moses assures them is that God never forgets or abandons or leaves us to our own devices. There is in that moment a trusting that the God who created us will sustain us. As so often happens, I turn to poetry to find messages that reinforce the message of scripture. And I came across one by a poet I had not encountered before by the name of Denise Levertov. A very short poem, I'll share it with you, but just to kind of set the scene, she describes what it's like to lie in the water facing up to the sky with nothing to hold you up but the water itself. Or the image of birds who will use all kinds of energy to get themselves up to a particular height or into a particular draft of air. And then they can stop and glide and the air itself will support them. That's what it's like to entrust ourselves to God. So the poem, titled The Avowal by Denise Levertov. 
As swimmers dare to lie face to the sky, and water bears them. As hawks rest upon air, and air sustains them. So would I learn to attain free fall and float into the Creator Spirit's deep embrace, knowing no effort earns that all surrounding grace. Amen. Let us now share together in an affirmation of our faith in the words of the Creed, page 8 of your bulletin. For we confess the faith of our baptisms as we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting. Amen. In this Lenten season, with confidence and trust, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. For the one holy Catholic and apostolic church throughout the world, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the mission of the church, that in faithful witness it may preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. We pray for Linda, our primate, Sandra, our bishop, our wardens, Mayanne and Zachary, for Paul, our rector and dean, Helen, our associate priest, our deacons, Ray, Heather, and Maggie, Jillian, our engagement leader, Paul, Nick, Russ, Pauline, and all who make music in this place, and all who minister here in so many ways, both lay and ordained. We pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those preparing for baptism and for their teachers and sponsors, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. For peace in the world, that a spirit of respect and reconciliation may grow among nations and peoples, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor, the persecuted, the sick, and all who suffer, remembering especially Stephanie, Sharon, Grace, Lara, Freya, Paul, Shelley, Leslie, Anne, Francis, Susan, Cheryl, Maureen, Richard, Christopher, Heather, Leanne, Dorothy, Lucy, Jackie, April, Tim, Kara, Isabel, Bernie, Diane, Elizabeth, and Kent. For we also play, pray for refugees, prisoners, and all in danger, that they may be relieved and persecuted. We pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. Also, we remember those who have died, especially Joanne Drain and Mildred Lewis. We pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all whom we have injured or offended, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. For grace to amend our lives and to further the reign of God, we pray to you, Lord. 
Lord, have mercy. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. God welcomes sinners and invites us to this table. Let us confess our sins confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name, amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And the peace of the Lord be always with you. In our preparations of the altar to share in Eucharist, we sing hymn 352, Amazing Grace.
at page 10 of today's bulletin, The Prayer Over the Gifts, as we give thanks that today wine and hosts are given in memory of loved ones from Judy McDonald. As we offer these gifts and offer ourselves, let us pray. God, our provider, you have not fed us with bread alone, but with words of grace and life. Bless us and these your gifts, which we receive from your bounty, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right to thank you and praise you, holy and gracious God, creator of all things, ruler of heaven and earth, sustainer of life. For you are the source of all goodness, rich in mercy and abounding in love. You are faithful to your people in every generation, and your word endures forever. Therefore, with angels and archangels and the fellowship of saints, the company of heaven, we glorify your holy name, evermore praising you and singing. Let us pray. We praise you, merciful Father, not as we ought, but as we are able, because in your tender love you gave the world your only Son, in order that the world might be saved through him. He made you known by taking the form of a servant, healing the sick, liberating the oppressed, reaching out to the lost. Betrayed, reviled, and nailed to the cross, he confronted the power of sin and disarmed it forever. In his offering of himself, he became the perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Redeemed by Christ, we have been adopted as your children. By your pardon, you have made us worthy to praise you. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus, at supper with his friends, took bread, gave you thanks, broke the bread, gave it to them and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this 
for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. In obedience to him, and with grateful hearts, we approach your holy table, remembering our Savior's sacrifice and rejoicing in his victory, confident in his sovereign purpose, we declare our faith. Send your Holy Spirit on us, that as we receive this bread and this cup, we may partake of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ and feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. May we be renewed in his risen life, filled with love and strengthened in our will to serve others, and make of our lives, we pray, a pure and holy sacrifice acceptable to you, knitting us together as one in your Son, Jesus Christ, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever. Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We, being many, are one body, for we all share in the one bread. And these are the gifts of God. For the people of God. Thanks be to God.
our closing prayer. Page 14 of today's bulletin. As we pray together, compassionate God, you have fed us with the bread of heaven. Sustain us in our Lenten pilgrimage. May our fasting be hunger for justice, our alms a making of peace, and our prayer the song of grateful hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. As you go forth into the world, go with the knowledge that God journeys with you and take with you God's blessing. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. As our closing hymn, hymn 616, Father of heaven whose love profound.